Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, we met on Twitter, right? And um, this was through Elevate Chat, uh, which you do every Friday. And it's like 4 p.m. in the afternoon for me, although it was 3 p.m. last week because of the time switch. And um, it's really, really great. And I, I remember Elevate Chat or Chats on Twitter was, was a big thing in the past when, it first, when Twitter first started and then it just died off. So I was so pleased that somebody was still doing it and um, I've, I've really enjoyed them. So thanks for coming on the podcast because that's how we met through Elevate Chat. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for joining my chat. I appreciate the support. Twitter chats have actually been a really um, fun and interesting way for me to network with so many people all over the world in different areas of marketing and business and nonprofits. So I, um, I try and participate in two or three Twitter chats a week. And then, of course, I host Elevate Chat, which is every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So depending on, yeah, I know the time change kind of messed a few people up. Um, but I'm based in Eastern Standard Time. So it's at 11 a.m. every Friday. And we discuss uh, lots of different topics. Mostly they're going to be related to business marketing. Um, and I have different guests on sometimes too, that talk about other related topics. Uh, Brilliant. An audience. They're really good. And they're, they're really professionally put together. I have to say, um, some beautiful images that you share and some really, really great very sometimes quite difficult questions to answer <laughs> you really have to like i want to jump in and kind of go oh i want to give my answer but i'm kind of go oh no i need to sit and really think about this you know why have i got the answer to this straight away and it's making me think and i, I i'm like okay i mustn't look at the other answers because i, I don't want to be influenced <laughs> and it's like really weird thing <laughs> going on in my head honestly though sometimes i join twitter chats on topics that i'm still just learning about like search engine optimization there's chats that are hosted about seo and i don't have the answers so i appreciate learning from all the other people that contribute to those chats it's a really fun way to learn oh i i will talk about seo if we get a chance <laughs> but we're here we're here to hear about your story and I really am interested because I'm so curious about your business and other names of businesses that you're involved in. And, and you have a really interesting model. So, Sarah, I'm going to hand over to you. Please share us your story. How did it all begin? Where did it start? So you uh, you suggested that I talk about where I grew up and that's easy. I was, um, I was born in Milton, Ontario, but I actually was raised most of my life in Orangeville, Ontario. And that's where I am now. That's where my home base is. That's where I run my business out of. So I consider myself a very small town, um, hometown kind of girl. I'm fourth generation of people living in this small town and my kids are actually the fifth generation. So we have a lot of history here and I am very proud that I've been able to build a business here in my hometown. Most of our team members are based here or close by, even though right. we're currently all working remote. Now I do have some team members at Duffer Media that are um, like from Toronto or other places, but for the most part, we're all pretty close. So that's been um, an important part of my story is being um, raised in Orangeville and um, I moved away for a period of time to explore the city, of course, which most young people do, but yes. was quick to come back to the smaller town. I prefer the country. I live on, um, <laughs> nice. I live on 48 acres of country property up north of town. And I just love the space and the quiet. Oh, that sounds idyllic. That's brilliant. And so, were you, so you were educated there too? And 
Yeah, I actually took accounting. That was my um, my schooling, and and I um, I went to college for accounting, and I worked in some uh, larger businesses down in the city in in Toronto doing accounting. Um, I got to a certain point and I just was not, I knew that that wasn't quite the road that I wanted to take. So I switched over and started doing marketing in 2003. I started working in digital marketing. So that's sort of how long I've been doing digital marketing for. Um, that's, a, that's a big switch from yeah. accounting to digital marketing. So I'm really curious to know how that came about. <laughs> I, you know, I don't, it was more of just a natural, there was an opportunity for me to um, start working with a digital marketing firm that was launching. So I jumped right in and oh. it just, it felt so natural. But um, before that, like when I was in my sort of teen years and in my early twenties, I worked in restaurants. So I was sort of front end um, hostessing, bartending, serving, and I think that all of those things have helped me. They've given me certain skills to pull through to my business. Definitely working in customer service. Mm. Cannot stress enough how valuable that was to me, how hard it probably was for me at the time. But working yeah. in a difficult customer service environment and learning how to, you know, have to think quick on your feet, and make quick decisions and multitask and, deal with complaints and all of those things were incredibly beneficial for me to learn early in life. Mm. Yeah. But, but did you have an interest in digital marketing then when you were in accounting as well? No, no, I don't rec I just, you know, thought I was going to be in accounting. <laughs> I mean, I really don't, it just happens so naturally that the opportunity was in front of me. So I jumped in. And, and what were your, you know, what did you have to do in that role? Um, so that's going back and really pulling at my memory strings. Um, <laughs> it was, so the initial um, tasks that I learned when it had to do with digital marketing was really in that old, banner sales um, yes. sort of position where the websites that were running back in the, those eras, if they had enough traffic, they could sell the banner site. Um, the That's banner right. Site. So that was a part of it. I worked um, and there were text link sales and all kinds of different sort of older digital marketing pieces. Eventually that converted a little bit over. I did some work in pop unders and pop ups, um, embedded ads. And then I spent a lot of time working with mobile app installs back when candy crush and everything was coming out, made right. some, had some fun with that. Um, but really it was in 2008. Um, and I know that it was 2008 cause that's when my third child was born is I ventured into um, being a mortgage agent for a little while. So right. as part of um, my family business, we had about 12 rental properties. And a lot of the tasks that I was doing was to help secure and negotiate the mortgages for those rental properties. So what I decided to do was actually get my license so that I could work on doing those myself and save the commission for our family business. Yeah. So I became a mortgage agent. And what I learned from that experience was I absolutely hated doing mortgages. It was just not for me at all. It brought me back mm. to those days in accounting that I was not interested in, in really working on that piece. But I taught myself how to generate leads on social media. So I took a whole bunch of do it yourself courses on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. And I, um, that's where just it fired me up. And I was getting so many leads from these social media ads that I continued to learn and work through that. And then in 2012 is when I launched Duffer and Media. And that was based on the, um, the, the hole that I saw in the marketplace, especially here in my local town, but I'm sure this was relevant all over, is that small businesses 
I knew that they could benefit from being on those social media platforms and posting consistently, but most business owners didn't know how or didn't have the time to do that. So we created yeah. Dufferin Media as a service solution, an outsourced service where we would take care of all that for them. And right. that's how Dufferin Media was born. Oh, wow. And so how did you then approach people to get interested in that when you know people weren't really clear on how to do this yeah i know it was um knocking on a few doors of business owners that we knew personally and just basically saying you know we're launching this new service if you're interested and so it was really word of mouth for our first like five or ten clients of doing that knocking on doors before we started building up that sort of awareness and reputation yeah and, yeah, and being able to do the digital marketing ourselves. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, I remember when it all started happening, social media, I saw the gap and that needed that people needed help with it. And I think I was just too early. So I started speaking to people about it and people just turned around to me and went, what, Twitter? Well, I don't want to know what they've had for lunch. You know, that's all they're putting on Twitter, right? What they've had for lunch and things like that. And people were being really negative. And then when I told people that I was a social media expert, they used to say, oh, no, not another one. And people were getting really quite negative about it. So I then decided, OK, I won't teach Facebook or Twitter, I kind of knew it inside out, but I went, oh, I'm not going to bother with that. I'm just going to focus on LinkedIn. So I spent about five years teaching people how to do LinkedIn. But I, I, I don't know what it was. I was teaching people there was obviously something wrong with my approach because they wouldn't do anything. They wouldn't do what I told them to do. <laughs> you know, it was like, Oh my God, you know, and they were going, oh, well, it's not really working for me. Yeah, but you haven't even updated your profile. You know, what do you expect? Um, so it's, yeah, I've had a really kind of love and falling out of love with social media journey, you know, since like 2008, 2009. Um, so I don't know how that's going for you and your clients. Do they do what you teach them to do? <laughs> well, it's, I guess that's why I've got a two tiered approach now is the reality is, is the marketplace has definitely changed even since when we started Dufferin Media in 2012. Now it's expected that every single business and organization will have a presence on social media. Yes. You will have a website and you will have social media. And if you don't, are you even in business? Potential customers will just walk away because you're not relevant in their marketplace. Yes. Um, you're not going to be top of mind. You're not going to be the first person they choose. They're not going to respect the fact that you don't have a website that hasn't been updated since 2010. Um, so it's a different marketplace now because hopefully the business owners that really want to stay competitive and dominate their marketplace, they get it they get the fact that they need to have a modern responsive website. They need to have consistent social media and be engaging and be human and being creating content that's valuable and standing out from the noise. So the business owners that are going to be successful, they get it. Yeah. And they're either going to be willing to, um, to invest in having it done in-house, either if it's a small business owner, they're going to do it themselves or they're going to hire somebody and delegate it to them. Hopefully it just won't be, you know, the, the same person that's answering the phones or like they actually have somebody that's experienced and, and yes. educated a little bit. Hopefully I do see it happening the other way, but um, so that's what Dufferin Media does. Dufferin Media offers an outsourced solution so that they never have to worry about that being done. They yeah. know they need to be on LinkedIn because it will benefit their business, but they have no interest in doing it themselves. Great. The task gets outsourced to an agency like Duffer Media. On the other side, I have Duff, I have the Sarah Clark um, dot biz profile, which is myself. Yes. And I offer is the coaching. So just like you were talking about how you used to teach people how to use LinkedIn, I do 
uh, coaching programs where I will help people through the different stages of, um, first of all, helping to clearly establish their business goals, their branding, and develop a strategy. So they're not just floundering around, not sure how to promote their business. We make sure all the pieces are in place first and then create a clear plan based on their goals, based on their branding. What should their digital marketing strategy be? And I help coach them so that they can, if they wish, do it themselves to make sure that their website has a consistent blog post. They're doing email marketing. They're posting on their social media regularly. So I kind of coach them through each of the pieces. And that's why we have the two different solutions. There's different media that does it for them, or there's the coaching program that helps people learn how to do it themselves. And, and I teach people one-on-one, and I have a weekly group coaching program too. Great, great. Right, that makes a lot of sense. And I think you know, that is definitely what people need. If they want to do it themselves, they can coach, <laughs> you can coach them. If yeah. they don't want to do it, they can outsource it. <laughs> yeah, that's Yeah. Like, I mean, genius. I know, I know how to do bookkeeping. I took accounting. I know mm. how to get my set of books. I know debits and credits. I know how to prepare financial statements and bank records. I don't have the time, nor do I want to do that. So yeah. I have a lovely bookkeeper that takes care of all of that for me. Yes. Yeah. So I can focus on what I'm really good at, which is the visionary stuff and the strategy. And that's what I think small business owners, they wear too many hats. It gets mm. possible to get anything done because they're mm. trying to do everything. Mm. Delegation has been my key to growth, 100%. I delegate everything I can. Yeah, that's it's, it's a good strategy for small businesses if they can afford it to be able to do that because the you're reality, right well they can't afford not to <laughs> yeah that's it yeah good point right like if you're not willing to invest whether it's you doing the digital marketing or somebody else you're not going to mm. grow you're not yeah. going to meet goals yeah so that's and, that's the belief i have pardon that is the belief that i have yeah i think it's right i you know, I, I don't think people realize, and I think the other mistake I see is people think they know how to do it <laughs> because, you know, or I, yeah, I'm on social media. I know what to do, you know, well, they know how to, you know, create a profile and post something, but that's not the same as having a strategy and how to populate it cleverly so that you get noticed, I would say. Is that right? Uh, absolutely. I think I applaud the business owners that are at least making an effort because I think yeah. that that's if they're really, if they're, they're posting consistently and they're trying to engage with their audience, I think that's a huge step and will definitely put them above any of their competition that's not doing that, for sure. But mm. you will be far more successful if you clearly have a strategy, just like you were saying, if you, I love the word clever, cleverly, that's great. <laughs> if you carefully craft your strategy and your messages and everything is according to your brand, it's going to just accelerate the growth of your company. There's no mm. question. I see it every day. I see clients come to me and they will say, you know, um, before I started with you, um, I wasn't, you know, getting clients very regularly and now I'm booked up for months and I have a waiting list. Mm. And it's wonderful to hear those success stories because I know that it works. And I know that working with nonprofits and small businesses, I see it every day and it's very rewarding to, yeah, to help people get towards their goals. Mm. And it's very frustrating when they don't get it, but I cannot run everybody's business for them no 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 myself of, course <laughs> <laughs> of course you can't so i mean it's it's interesting because i'm kind of reflecting on let's say i think the key thing that you've said in everything there is about you know the strategy um and i think that often is lacking in people's approach so 
for example, one of the things I do is whiteboard animations for people, a little bit of storytelling in a hand drawn kind of video. And people just come and just do a one off video to put on their website or on social media. And they don't do anything else with it. They, there is no thought out strategy how to use that asset as part of a larger campaign with all of the other assets that might be going along with it. And it must be my fault for not making it clear to them, <laughs> you know, to say, well, you know, what about a campaign around this or, you know, try and help them with that. And I think in listening to you and having, I'm kind of reflecting on what am I doing wrong and how can I make my offer different so that I'm not just producing a piece of an asset, a marketing piece of asset, but there is something else that I can offer them alongside it in terms of a campaign or suggest they go to somebody else like, like you <laughs> and say, you know, work with Sarah to help you with your strategy around it rather than just, you know, produce a piece of collateral. I, um, I'd be really interested in more information on maybe getting something like that produced for us. Hmm. And then I could learn more about what that whiteboard animation process looks like. I think that it sounds like very valuable, as you said, asset. Mm. Um, what I can relate it to is work that I have done with a photographer who is a branding photographer. So she specializes in working with small business owners. Mm. She does fabulous headshots. So she did my headshot that I use on everything. Um, and she does branding photos for small businesses. So yeah. whether like at their location or a product, that sort of thing, but the branding photos. And one of her frustrations is just like what you were saying is that she'll do these beautiful um, assets for a business owner and nothing gets done with them. Mm. So there's peace there, an opportunity maybe to educate your clients or educate these business owners that when content is created, it is a valuable asset of your business that you can multi-purpose and use for a long time. So where could that whiteboard animation go? Where could these branding photos go? When they can, when can they be used again in the future and in an ongoing basis? So, yes, you know, it, it could have a place on your website. It could have a place on your YouTube channel. It could be shared to your social media more than once, <laughs> like repurposed. And, and even six months from now, I'm sure it's still going to be relevant. So multi-purposing that evergreen content, that's really a term that, um, could be mm. used probably in the, in the content that you're creating for your clients. Um, I think I, yeah, I heard that term evergreen and I couldn't think of it the other day. So thank you very much for sharing that. Um, yeah, it's, it's like it can basically live forever almost. Right. So yes. if an article that you publish that has long-term relevance, you can still share it a year from now or reshare it or rewrite it slightly or do a new graphic for it. And off it goes again. Um, that's what evergreen content is, is something that it really is a digital asset of your business. hundred percent. And I've, I've always said to people, you know, okay, you have a, you have a video, which is say, I mean, this applies, we're just having a conversation because this applies to anybody doing any kind of video. It's not just talking about my animations, but yeah, it could it could relate to anything. I mean, first of all, a video usually is like people always make it too long for starters. They say, oh, we want a two minute animation. I went, really? That's quite long. Oh, uh, and it ends up being two and a half minutes, which is even far too long. People kind of lose interest after, you know, I mean, now with with TikTok world, you know, people have got mm -hmm. attention span of about 15 seconds. And anyway, but you could take clips from that video animation, whatever, and create it into animated GIFs, Yeah, you know, and have that play on its own. Yeah. You could take stills from it and share that. Um, you could 
sit it, do it in a presentation. You can, you know, there are so many multi-purpose ways that it can be used, as you say. And that's not just a, an animation. It could be any video clip of any kind, you know, that people just need to be creative with it and say, we've invested this money and time and effort in creating this bit of collateral. How can we leverage it and, and you know, get every squeeze every little bit out of it um as you said for multi-purpose use yeah and i'm not against having a longer form video or um your whiteboard animation there's a place for that you can use it as a permanent asset on your youtube channel you can have it embedded on your website so the people that are interested in learning more they can watch the full version of it but then absolutely having those smaller clips that you can share on Instagram or TikTok or wherever you want to use them. I love personalized GIFs. That's so fun. Um, has it just further maximizes the use of that investment? Yes. Yeah. There, there is a, I forget the term, but it's a, it's a, it's probably about a couple of years ago. I came across a term that somebody used and if, if you look at hollywood and what they you know how they leverage a you know like say guardians of the galaxy or whatever you know there's like a number one a number two a number three a number four you know it just they leverage they pull everything out of it that they can you know they may bring in some new whether well, it's the star wars saga or any of these movie um stories that they've created in Hollywood or whatever studio, uh, they just keep leveraging it and leveraging it. And it, it just gets ingrained into us. You know, we, we, we never forget about these movies. We might forget a specific <laughs> movie, but we don't, we'll never forget the series of movies and know that they were famous for all of these you know, and people kind of pride themselves of making sure that they have seen every single one. Um, they become super fans and, and it's, it should be no different in business. Absolutely. And I think that what we can learn from that is that they're really good at keeping top of mind. They're everywhere. They're visible on all ad channels that you look, um, people talk about it. Um, the, the, the lesson that we can learn there in business, I think, is the um, magic of repetition. And I've read different articles about how many times it takes the average human brain to remember a piece of information that we're seeing. And in advertising, they used to say that you'd have to touch somebody like seven times before they'd remember it. I think That's now... Right the world, it's more than that. Because in digital mm. today, if I think about how much content I'm consuming, it's ridiculous. Like the amount of, if I'm looking at TikTok videos, or if I'm scrolling through Instagram, or if I'm scrolling through Facebook or looking through Twitter, there's so many things that we're seeing every day compared to, you know, the original advertising statistic that that, that relates to. We probably have to see content 30 times before we remember it. So that's the beautiful mm. thing about a really well put together social media campaign. If you're on all the platforms, I get this all the time. People are like, I see you everywhere. <laughs> you're always <laughs> on Facebook or Instagram. I'm like, that's the point. <laughs> yes. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Um, because that visibility and the consistency of what you're sharing is people see you and then eventually you become top of mind so that when that consumer is ready to start investigating your product or service, you're top of mind. Mm. So the real estate agents that are doing really well, they're branding themselves very, very strategically, very um, uniquely, and they're putting their information and their face everywhere. So that when I'm ready to buy or sell a home, I remember that, that one that I've seen everywhere. So the ones that have high competition, uh, businesses. I don't know if it's the same in, in the UK, but here in Canada, real estate is one of our top competitive markets. There's 
I think in my small town alone, there's like 400 registered real estate agents. And at any given time, there's maybe 50 listings. Mm. So it's an incredibly competitive market. And yeah. that personal branding and the branding and marketing is what will set the successful ones apart. Yes. And that's one of the reasons why I have created the personal branding for Sarah Clark, because it has its own sort of purpose, but it's also to help build the business of Dufferin Media by giving Dufferin Media a face. Right. Because people relate to that more and being human and being authentic and being out there and vulnerable. And that's how things um, in marketing now, I think, are working is we're mm. needing that more human connection more than ever because everything's digital. All the brands are just posting their logos and their sales posts and that's boring. <laughs> They want yes. to talk to people. I agree. I mean, that's why <clears throat> I don't I don't know how much you've investigated Clubhouse. Um not yet. <laughs> not yet. No. Are, you, uh, are you are you iOS or Android? I'm iOS. Okay, right. Well, I I you you need to go on it. Definitely, because but you said, did you say I know? I know, I did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Why don't you invite me? <laughs> Pardon? I don't have an invitation. I I don't know. I can't send a text message to you from this country oh. um, because I've got enough invites to invite you, but I don't know how. I'll have to have a look and see how I can do it. But um, but anyway, forget about Clubhouse. We need to talk about Twitter Spaces as well, but. Yeah. But the thing is, why is Clubhouse so successful? Well, why is there so much hype around Clubhouse? Because they've had such phenomenal growth. Why have they had so much growth? We're in the middle of a pandemic. We've all been locked down. We've not been able to see people or speak to them, really. Lots of people are suffering with Zoom burnout. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at screens, here is a facility where you can speak to loads of people online. And, and the point, and the reason I'm mentioning it is your point about human contact, human to human. And I think Clubhouse has given us that message, confirmation of what you've just said. Yeah, I agree. I think that's why it's experiencing such growth is and mm. i think that's why TikTok is too because people feel like they can connect with the person they're seeing their face they're seeing their video. yeah the videos work well um definitely that is is huge and the twitter spaces too is mm. that's what it is people like to talk to each other yeah and not brands yeah i mean i've been you know dipping in and out of clubhouse and i haven't really done anything on it because I'm still kind of thinking about what is it that I could do. I've got because I've got this podcast, I'm thinking something along those lines. But yeah, I'm just kind of holding back a little bit to see how, what shakes out, if you know what I mean, because inevitably it will shake out to something that is steady at the moment. It's just it's just a bit frantic there. Mm. And, and you can tell in people's voices, they're all a bit hyper. Um, they really are. And, um, yeah, but it was really just to confirm the point of what you were saying about that human relationship and which actually brings me on to one of the things you mentioned, I think earlier about SEO and I'm not an expert on SEO, have never been, but I watched a guy, uh, I use HubSpot, free HubSpot, and they've got fantastic kind of learning academy in there for free. Really, yeah. really amazing. And I decided to watch an SEO video and I was just in the space of 40 minutes, I learned more about SEO than I have in all my time in digital. Oh, it's just was, 
I was blown away and I went, I wish I'd known that like 10 years ago. I mean, my SEO's not bad. You know, if you Google me or my company name, it's all on page one, it's fine. But not necessarily for what I want to be found for. <laughs> and, um, and one of the things I've always heard about, I, I just feel like I want to share it because I'm talking to you and we can chat about this. One of the things I, I, I learned about, which just, I always had like, yeah, well, you know, everyone, I'm always getting emails every week saying, oh, can you put our link on your website? Can you please do a blog for us and point it back to our website? I mean, there's no doubt about it. Google rewards people for backlinks, right? I'm convinced. I'm convinced. I've had people on the podcast talking about it. This guy was talking about it. But there was one significant difference he made when he presented it to me. And he said the word relationship. You need to build a relationship with someone who is more than willing to put your link on their website somewhere. It's just kind of natural to just say, yes, no problem, you know, and which really confirms your point again about that human touch, the relationship. Yeah, I believe backlinks is one of the factors. Um, there's over 200 factors that we know about that Google uses to rank websites. Backlinks we know is one of them. Trusted backlinks, that's the important thing. And I think that probably what um, the person on that course was talking about is there's a lot of scammy backlink processes out there and that's yeah. dangerous. And I actually got trapped into that on my uh, last blog version that I had is it got hacked and all these scummy backlinks started showing up and I had to redo my site. So whoa, that I think is what leads into exactly what he was talking about is when you're looking at a backlink strategy for your website in order to improve SEO, it's really important that you're doing it with trusted sources and building a relationship around that is incredibly valuable. So if you're going to do something like an exchange a blog post with somebody in order to get the backlink value, make sure it's somebody that you know, and then it's adding value to your audience. That is the relationship building part. You're collaborating. You're going to share that blog post on your social media. They're going to share it on their social media. So there's a bit of that strategy behind it too. Um, I have, links on my website to friends websites that are in my elevate coaching program because that's one of the ways that we can benefit each other yes. but they're people i know they're people yes. i have relationships with i would not just put a backlink up for somebody that sent me an email no way no it's not the way it's done you build a relationship first yeah so that's yeah. really good advice yeah and i it was yeah, for me, it was like the penny dropped when I realized that. And therefore, you know, and that means it's a long process. It's not a quick win because it takes yeah. time. Yeah, you don't need a hundred backlinks to your site. If you have just start building a few that are valuable, that's a mm. better strategy for yeah. sure. And again, it's only one of the 200 known factors. So it, there needs to be a lot of other stuff happening too. If you're building your um, search engine optimization. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure there's a lot. <laughs> it's, so, I'm not an expert at all at SEO. I just, based on everything that I've sort of learned through doing that, I think I've done those courses too at HubSpot. Like I just yeah. learned. It well. Yeah. So Sarah, let's, let's take a slight diversion because I know you're really passionate about, um, nonprofits and you do some nonprofit work yourself. So yeah. tell us a little bit about that. Um, so I uh, grew up in a home that wasn't necessarily financial, financially stable and our family had to make use of food bank services. So um, when I grew up, that was always something that I was very conscious of and uh, when I had the opportunity, I started volunteering at my local food bank. So I've been volunteering there for about seven and a half years. 
do all their social media for them. Um, of course, that's sort of what I slid into, but I um, also like to be involved on the frontline services as well and just be able to um, communicate uh, with the clients directly and, and offer them support. And so that's something that is really important to me is that whole giving aspect. And yes. um, so we at Dufferin Media, we, our whole team believes in giving back to the community. And we've always offered favorable rates for nonprofit organizations for social media management or websites. And we um, have done an adopted charity campaign for three years in a row now. So we run a campaign in December where we accept nominations for nonprofits to apply for full year digital marketing services uh, for wow. no fee. And then our team gets together just after Christmas and we vote and we select a nonprofit organization and we work with them for a full year. So that's been happening for three years now. This year we actually adopted two charities because we just felt like with the pandemic and everything happening in the world that the charities could use more help now than ever. Yes. Their need to support more people has gone up, but their opportunity to fundraise has gone down because a lot of them, relied on in-person events for fundraising. Yeah. So that whole piece um, of my business is incredibly important to me. And we're actually going to be launching a new division coming up. Uh, we were going to do it April 1st. It's slightly delayed because of a new uh, innovation that we're adding into it. But Dufferin Media Cares is going to be a new division of Dufferin Media that's going to focus 100% on nonprofit organizations worldwide, where we're going to offer not only the digital marketing services at a favorable rate, but there's going to be a membership area where uh, key players and nonprofits can have the opportunity to learn, network, um, and collaborate with each other. So there's going to be a, a membership area piece, and there's going to be a giving program so that funds that are um, raised through revenues in the membership program and the digital marketing services will be funneled back into those nonprofit organizations. So there's three pieces in that. And then as if that's not enough, this is why I'm not on Clubhouse yet because I don't have time. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> if that's not enough, our new innovation that we're adding in is the web accessibility piece. So this is incredibly important uh, for us to make sure that we get this right. Um, there is accessibility um, legislation. There's a worldwide initiative for accessibility and then there's local initiatives. Locally here in Ontario where I am, that's my province, any business or organization over 50 employees by June 30th have to be web compliant or they could face fines of up to $50,000 a day. Wow. That being said, that's just the regulation that's coming in, but there's such, mm. there's a bigger issue here. And I think it's for all businesses and all organizations. We have a social responsibility to be aware of accessibility issues and how it relates to our website, how it relates to our social media, are we really making our content inclusive for anybody that might be interested in viewing it or benefit from viewing it? Or like if we're talking about businesses, is your website accessible to any of your clients that are interested in buying from you? Mm. Can they mm. access your videos? Can they read them? Can they hear them? Can they read the transcripts? Like what's happening there with all of that content? Mm. Um, if they have low vision or are colorblind, can they see your content mm. on your website? So this accessibility issue is an innovation that we're bringing in through Dufferin Media Cares and it's going to be rolled out through all Dufferin Media clients as well. Our entire team is going to get uh, certified in web accessibility. So right now myself and my um, one of my webmasters is taking the course and we're going to be fully web um, certified and then we're going to start rolling this out to especially the nonprofits. I was speaking to a nonprofit a couple of weeks ago, small nonprofit. They don't even have any paid employees, let alone 50. Right. 
but they couldn't apply for a grant because their website was not accessible. Ah. Huge problem if you're a small nonprofit organization. Yeah. And you can't apply for a grant, that's that has incredible implications on what you can do with your nonprofit. So so the accessibility so does that mean you're you will be able to provide a apart from doing all of your own assets but you'll be able to provide a service to non-profits and also other profitable you know profit organizations for profits as well in terms of making their business more uh, their website more accessible yeah 100% yeah yeah, that's our goal is to help roll it out. So we're going to have, um, I'm just putting together our uh, audit package. So we'll be able to offer a free audit. That's one of the goals I have. So that right. people, we just want to, to be honest, one of my goals right now is to at least increase awareness yes. of accessibility issues and what businesses and nonprofits could and should be aware of when it comes to mm. their business. Um, so raising awareness and then helping them become accessible. So mm. we've got solutions that we're going to roll out for website creation to make new websites. All of our new websites are going to be accessible, accessibility compliant. Um, and then also to help existing websites audit what we can to try and at least get them on the right direction that they're, that they're moving forward to become more accessible because yeah. at the end of the day, it benefits everyone and it benefits the people that are trying to access their website um gives an incredible reputation boost to a business or organization when they can say you know we have um strived and we are now fully accessible for anybody that needs to use our website no matter what technology they're using or um what um, disabilities they may have or accessibility devices that they're using to, to read the content, whether it's a, um, you know, a, read, a text reader or um, a braille machine, or there's all kinds of accessibility devices yes. out there. So is your website compliant? I can tell you right now, mine's not. No. And mine, I'm mine wouldn't be. No. Working towards that. Mm. So very, very interesting. Yeah. Because I, not, not long ago, I was on a, somebody was doing some stuff on websites and I was joining and he was making a real thing about it. And he was showing websites where you can upload your image and check your image, whether people that are colorblind or people that are short sighted or, you know, limited vision, what they would see, um, you know, putting text with your image and explaining what it is. And I had no idea. And I noticed on LinkedIn when you post stuff, they're asking for descriptions and things like, and I went, oh, I just said skip, skip. And then it dawned on me afterwards, some time afterwards, I went, oh no, this is really important because, you know, this is for people who, who, who can't see uh, properly and they need to hear what it is. So, yeah. which is interesting because my mother-in-law is losing her sight and so we've been on this journey of, you know, devices in the home that talk to her and she listens to audio books and, you know, there's all sorts of other things that, so yeah, made me more aware, but I never related it to my business. Yeah. And we were talking about SEO earlier. Mm. It's interesting because everything that I've learned up till now, when it talks about alt text or alternative text, it's always yes. talking about the benefits for SEO. So when you add a picture to your website or you add a picture to social media, the alt text option, I always use or suggest people use for SEO benefit. So if you yes. tell Google what that picture is, it's going to help in your search rankings. Mm. I did. Now I'm able to apply it one step further and go, not only does it help your search engine rankings, it makes sure that that image is now accessible to people that maybe can't actually see it, but the computer or whatever they're reading will be able to tell them, this is a picture of a cute puppy. And it puts everything into context for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's honestly, it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds amazing. Well, 
I wish you so much luck with that. <laughs> Sounds fantastic. Um, sleep. <laughs> <laughs> now I've, I've so if I have a couple of questions because I notice a quote on the windowsill behind you, and I'm intrigued by it. it. Says, "Save the drama for your llama." I know, and I have a little llama here. <laughs> oh, brilliant! <laughs> so, um, is that just a mantra of yours? <laughs> I think that, uh, yes, definitely a mantra. I have, I've witnessed too many people getting bogged down in drama and, and gossip and worrying yes. about what other people are doing and talking about what other people are doing. And yes. Um, so I just like to stay out of it, focus on what we're doing here in our team and wish everybody else the most success because there is enough abundance in this town and in this county and in this world for all of us to succeed together. So that's sort mm. of where that lands for me is we just, we don't need to be dramatic about everything. I love it. <laughs> we need to I be fighting and, and talking behind people's backs and all that stuff. Just be real. Yeah. hundred percent. Well, thank you for that wisdom, Sarah, and, and thank you so much for sharing so openly some of your tips and ideas. And please share with us uh, where people can find you. I know everywhere on social media, but <laughs> <laughs> tell us tell us the names they need to be searching for. Thank you. Yes. So um, www.dufferinmedia.com. D-U-F-F-E-R-I-N media.com will take you to the company website and all the links for social media are there. And then my own personal branded blog and website is www.sarahclark.biz. So S-A-R-A-H-C-L-A-R-K-E.biz. And again, all my social media links and my email is listed there. So um, please don't hesitate to reach out on any social media platforms or via email. Yeah, and, and do join the hashtag Elevate Chat on Twitter at so 11 a.m. Eastern. Yeah. On every Friday. Friday. Yeah, it's really good fun. So please come and join us for that. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Um, it's great fun. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed it. So I will definitely try and make it. Uh, well, uh, this week it will be 3 p.m. next week because our I think our clocks are going forward. Oh, this yeah. weekend so <laughs> then we'll be back to 4 p.m <laughs> so, that <is> so confusing. <laughs> but yeah i we never get told when you know the canada and the us kind of move their clocks we we never know we kind of go oh they must have oh because it's normally about two weeks before us so which is also really weird yes. um, but there you go Sarah, thanks so much for joining me and I'll see you on Twitter on Friday. Amazing. Thanks so much for having me. It was really fun. My pleasure. Take care. Bye for now. Bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.